souls? Does he ever deserve redemption? Does he deserve our forgiveness? Does he deserve the forgiveness of the people of West Suffolk? Uh, let's ask uh, from the Young Voices UK and British Conservative Alliance, Connor Tomlinson. Good evening to Connor. Is Connor there? He seems to have uh, disappeared from talk radio uh we'll he was waiting for us so uh, we're going to get him right back uh but yes that is the question uh does matt hancock deserve redemption in any shape or form uh and if so can he rebuild the career that he personally wrecked i think the people of britain will put up with some things but they will not put up with that level of hypocrisy they cannot put up with one rule for us and one rule for them uh connor uh, tomlinson from the young voices uk and british conservative alliance is now waiting for us uh good evening connor Good evening, Kevin. I can't see you on my end, but I'm sure your wonderful face looks excellent as well. Yeah, my wonderful face does look excellent. I <laughs> can't see you either, but uh, uh, feelings mutual, mate. Uh, what do you <laughs> think? Uh, does uh, uh, Matt Hancock, in any shape or form, deserve to be forgiven? Does he deserve redemption? Well, I think the, not to put it too harshly, but it comes down to, if you can't be trusted by your, by your wife, can you be trusted by a country? And I personally would deselect him for the terrible snogging technique alone. I've seen passionate <laughs> embraces in a club smoking section. But I would say before the charge of hypocrisy, which, okay, a lot of us in our personal lives may or may not be hypocrites. It's the old George Orwell thing of every Englishman is a hypocrite. However, those hypocrisy charges stick an awful lot more when you profess yourself to be so benevolent that you can place the entire country under household arrest and promise that will only be temporary because you're such a good person and then immediately break not only your marriage vows, but the values which underlie those laws. But before that terrible charge of flagrant hypocrisy, there's a fair amount of breadcrumb trails of some dodgy donations and some uh, corrupt contracts that have seemed to be going and, and underscoring Matt Hancock's career as well as some perhaps unsavoury political values. So personally, I don't see why not only should anyone give him a chance, but how he thinks he has a hope in hell in getting back in the first place. Uh, because he, as I said earlier, he's an ambitious little fellow. Uh, but <laughs> what I think he uh, revealed uh, at the height of the COVID crisis when we were being locked down left, right and centre and he was laying down the law like some Tim Pop dictator from a banana republic uh, that he doesn't understand British people. He doesn't understand mm. the British mentality uh, and he proved that by uh, the way he behaves at the health department uh, and then thinking he could get away with it. He thought he was going to hang on to his job. The one, as I just said, Connor, the one thing the British people will not put up with is uh, a system whereby there is one rule for them and one rule for us. He failed to un understand that fundamental fact about British people. Well, he reminds me very much of the old joke about engineers of, okay, invite them to any problem that you can uh, you can need solving but never bring them to a party because the man seems to be sort of a bit like mark zuckerberg where he's a lizard in a human skin suit that old uh, interview of him standing next to a woman so uncomfortably close he seems to be smelling her shampoo doesn't betray uh, a lot of consciousness about social mores but you're also right in that he seems to be a sort of timbok dictator a sort of social planner type because he seems to be having uh, very much the approach of i know he's supported some uh, of the more unsavory elements of Davos and Brussels and and, and happy of the sort of more remain agenda and and uh, even uh, back to people who thought that getting rid of our private property would be somehow utopian so I would I would say I would not trust someone in the old uh, adage of people who know Jordan Peterson who can't set their own bedroom in order but definitely want to go around tidying up the world <laughs> exactly well put I mean the the other aspect of this is, you know, to ask any politician, a successful politician, and they'll tell you that one of the major elements in uh, their good fortune uh, would have been luck. You have to have some luck in politics. So I would suggest, for example, Sajid Javid is a lucky politician because Matt Hancock got caught and he got the health secretary's job just as the tide was turning. So Matt Hancock uh, had very bad luck. He got caught at the wrong time. So he never got to benefit from us actually uh, admittedly falteringly coming out of the COVID crisis. So he's fallen uh, flat on his face when it comes to good fortune fortune as well hasn't he definitely though it's a shame i would say on a, on a purely selfish level that 
the deselection of Matt Hancock or his ultimate uh, untimely exit as health secretary hasn't brought forth, despite Sajid Javid saying he's got a lot of backbone before going into the role, the sort of change that we were all expecting. I mean, Javid, as you spoke in your in your opening monologue, decided to back off of preaching courage over cowardice, which is not only something that every man should do, but every political leader should do when we're emerging from a crisis, and also hasn't demonstrated much courage in and of himself before making that statement by letting get Boris and Gove push through vaccine passports on so-called Freedom Day. So it's it's a shame, ultimately, that we as the public haven't been so lucky by Javid's appointment either. Um, well, I do agree with you that uh, Sajid Javid uh, should never have apologised because he put the, his finger right on one of our major crises at the moment, and that is that people are cowering from COVID. Uh, as I keep saying, I was just down on a holiday a couple of weeks in the West Country, and down there, uh, because of Boris's July the 19th speech, uh, where he basically said, well, if you want to carry on with the uh, uh, lockdown principle and face masks and all that, be my guest, half the people are. Pubs are deciding they are new, now, you know, at the heart of our fight against COVID. So I was w walking into pubs. People asked me to put masks on. No, thanks. Uh, still those NH... Well, there's your NHS track and trace. I said, what do I need that for? It's after July the 19th. So people, half the people... Uh, the other thing I saw, Connor, you won't believe this. I saw people <laughs> swimming in the sea with face masks. You know, so so uh, th that uh, half and half system uh, is a big problem, isn't it? So he was right to say we have to stop cowering from COVID. And then he went and apologised. Why? I can't quite fathom why he would go and apologise. I understand the phenomena very much that you said about uh, people still continuing to almost act as a sort of like interpersonal Stasi, rather than the government having the enforcement costs or even the nightclubs and they're trying to shove it off of. They're just trying to get each other to do it so we'll, we'll happily conform. Uh, one of my friends, I'm going to embarrass him with this story, he's been doorstepping essentially, going around and telling people when they're going to have a bit of uh, internet maintenance work done on their road and he's walked up to some door some doors and they treat him like a bioweapon and cowered with a tea towel over their face it's it's rather embarrassing but to harken back to what you said earlier about the english spirit and essentially saying that matt hancock doesn't understand english liberalism essentially and how uh, every man's house is his castle and we've got stiff upper lip and whatnot that's what javid was tapping into he was essentially saying it's in the british character in times of crisis mm -hmm. to yes band together but also show a little bit of emotional stalwartness and and throw ourselves with full strength at a problem without bursting into tears at the first sight of, of, of an issue. And I think that's the message we really need for the recovery. And it's the message we should have been preaching from the start. Well, while I've got you on, Connor, uh, where, where are you on uh, vaccine passports? Uh, I think they're an abomination uh, and uh, should yeah. never come in. Where do you stand? Well, I was actually on Ian's show earlier in the week. I'm one of those uh, unfortunate souls who has problems actually getting the jab, particularly because I have uh, pretty acute form of anaphylaxis so Pfizer is more likely to kill me than any any COVID related illness so under these pretenses um, of, of the vaccine passports unless they bring in a really great exemption which still doesn't eliminate the principle of disbarring people from the private society or I can go to a club and did last weekend had a great time but as of September I'm out so for some strange reason I'm not a big fan of them <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's not just people like you and sympathies, by the way, uh, but, uh, you right. know, it's people who don't have smartphones, people who don't have mm. mobile phones. Uh, you know, as I keep stressing this point, that the underlying absurdity of this entire sort of pandemic debate, uh, and indeed, if they bring them in, what form vaccine passports are going to take, is if it's all to do with the NHS app, only 10 million people have got it. Yeah, it's and also it, it creates a pretty disturbing precedent for the sort of surveillance state in the information sector. I was on a little while ago on Christo's show talking about uh, a sort of mandated social media ID. And now we're getting virtual passports, vaccine passports, discussion of a, a mandatory social media ID and a form of health social credit system that rewards you if you've been a good boy and eaten your greens, which yeah. welcome to I eat far too much meat for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've, I've one, one Friday night kebab and you're a second class citizen. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty disturbing precedent when we're forming all of these sort of health and, and collective responsibility ideas together. Again, as you said, it's fundamentally anti-British and it will exclude plenty of people from participating in regular society. And do you, uh, you and I agree, uh, let's put this to bed once and for all, Boris Johnson is not a libertarian. Oh, absolutely not. Not by not by any any stretch of the word. He's I, I saw him best described as sort of Jekyll and Hyde figure because he'll do the most ab abhorrent 
acts of authoritarianism and go, yes, well, I feel quite bad about it. I don't care how you <laughs> feel about it, Boris. It matters about the principle. And on this and on every issue since the start of the pandemic, you've been utterly wrong. Yeah, and he used to write very eloquently uh, about freedom and about liberty. Uh, he said he'd eat his card with his cornflakes yeah. and then he's the one introducing them. Yeah, I remember when he said at the Tory conference he was going to eat as many Tory uh, turkey twi twizzlers as he could. Uh, <laughs> he's changed his tune a lot. So he is no libertarian, uh, but I think you and I might be, Connor. Uh, always yeah. great to talk. Let's talk again very soon. Connor Tomlinson there, Young Voices UK and British Conservative Alliance representative. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and this is Talk Radio.